Chapter 29, Internet. The Internet treats censorship as a malfunction and routes around it. John Perry Barlow. 29.1, Routing Around. Several significant telecommunications networks have been deployed since the telephone, including broadcast and cable television, which remains largely one way, though this may change with the advent of broadband cable modem service and video on demand, cellular telephone, including several distinct technology waves, and the Internet. All three have been very important in shaping activity patterns. The latter two have some important parallels with transportation as well. The Internet may be most interesting because of its potential. What most distinguishes the Internet from plain old telephone service, POTS, provided by AT&T and the regional Bell operating companies, is the use of packets for communication rather than keeping an entire circuit open for two-way communications. The analogy that the Internet is the car highway system to the POTS train has been made before and has some merit. Like the car, internet packets are small and discreet and have a variety of origins and destinations and share space on the network. Like a train, especially when we only have a single track, telephone requires a circuit between the origin and destination to be kept open. No other traffic can use that circuit. No other trains are allowed on that track. The analogy, of course, can be stretched too far, and there are important differences. In cars, the intelligence, one hopes, lies with the driver, while with the internet, Packets are given direction by routers, as if the traffic so signal told you which direction to go, not simply whether to go or not. Another analogy between the Internet and containerization might be more appropriate, as packets are more like freight than people. If a packet or freight container between Minneapolis and Tokyo must go by way of London, so be it, no one will complain if it is the low-cost route. A passenger making that trip would find it terribly inefficient. Another key facet of the Internet architecture is that it is distributed. Disable a link and the system can route around it. This is similar to a robust highway network and distinct from a hub-and-spoke network with a few critical points. The Internet was developed in the 1960s with funding from the D Department of Defense's Advanced Research Projects Administration and was originally called ARPANET, which was deployed in 1969. The figure shows the growth of the Internet from 1969 to 2002, using the number of computer hosts connected to the Internet as the metric of size. Other measures are number of users, amount of traffic, and so on, but those are less reliable than this infrastructure-based measure. They show the same basic trends. The S-curve phenomenon is we expect to play here as well. In the first edition of the book we wrote, we just have yet to see the slowdown in new hosts. More recent evidence finds that slowing, at least slowing in the rate of growth. More recent evidence finds that slowing, at least slowing in the rate of growth. Still, the maximum number of hosts is unknown. One can imagine, of course, one host for every personal computer, which would presumably max out at one or two or three per person, but then one for every phone, every car, every appliance, are not unreasonable speculations. Whether every electric outlet gets one may seem far-fetched, but the idea of a world where every electronic device has an address is plausible. That would give a very large number of potential host computers indeed. The Internet has, despite significant gov government involvement in its creation, remained largely unregulated. Some attempts at content regulation, the Communications Decency Act in the United States, have fortunately been unimplementable. Other attempts at using the legal system to copyright violations have had more success, the shutdown of the music trading service Napster, for instance. But for every Napster brought down, or more robust network, in this case a peer-to-peer -peer network with distributed indexes, such as Nutella or then BitTorrent, takes its place. Censorship remains in some countries. Saudi Arabia and China come to mind but the ability to get data on the Internet may outstrip the government's ability to censor. Other problems remain and don't see an easy solution. In 2004, Bill Gates was quoted as saying, two years from now, spam will be solved. It has yet to be. The content regulation on the Internet has analogy in transport in terms of the transport of prohibited goods, for example, drug trafficking, which have been very hard to restrict. While the penalties are severe if caught, getting caught is a low probability event especially given the low staffing levels of inspection services. Guardians do not have the time, or in general, the legal authority, to open every suitcase, every car trunk, and so on, except in commercial aviation, where scanners are used at considerable delay to passengers. The protocols for connection on the Internet and on other communications technologies are clear analogs to protocols and standards in transport. Trains must be on the same gauge as the track, and one railroad's track must be like others if transportation is to occur. Truck widths and weights are another example and must be compatible with the road. Trailers must have an interface with the truck. More recently, with containerization and the logistics revolution, 
as well as intelligent transportation systems, information technology is bringing a new layer to transportation. We discuss the internet for several reasons. One is comparisons between the history and deployment of communications and transportation. We have discussed these in some earlier chapters, from the post office through the telegraph and telephone, and think it is an important theme to continue. There is also the unanswered question of the relationship between internet service and transportation. Attention has been paid to telecommunity and clicks versus bricks as shopping moves online, but we already suspect more. For instance, 3D printing may suggest changes in transportation and production. One can purchase a replicator, $2,800, download an electronic design for a job, and produce a 3D product. It is certainly plausible to imagine a near future in which freight transportation ships more and finished or raw materials, the internet sends digital blueprints, and production of many things is local. Twenty nine point two network neutrality. A major argument recently has been whether and how the internet should be neutral. An advocacy group asserts net neutrality ensures that all users can access the content or run the applications and devices of their choice. With net neutrality, the network's only job is to move data, not choose which data to privilege with higher quality service. Net neutrality prevents the companies that control the wires from discriminating against content based on source or ownership. This argument has been enmeshed in public debate as providers of internet connections seek to charge the senders of data for data transmitted over their wires to their customers. Some in favor of neutrality argue the customers have already paid an access charge for internet service and should be able to receive bits of data from anywhere connected to the internet with no differentiation in the quality of service those bits receive. An example of this argument can be seen in the following quote. So imagine if turnpikes charged when you got on the road and then again when you got off. This is exactly what some of the telcos are trying to do with internet access. They see that internet access is a commodity and decreasing revenue from the cash cow that is circuit-based voice service and are looking for new sources of revenue. Similarly, an author satirically imagines transportation service providers charging for sidewalks in front of people's houses. Again, in that vein, think of the pipes and wires that you use to go online as a sidewalk. The question is whether the sidewalk should get a cut of the value of the conversations you have as you walk along. The notion of internet network neutrality garnered attention after the publication of an article by Wu, 2003. Networks, he argues, are not like typical businesses that discriminate, and the consequences would be much more severe. That paper suggested legislation to ensure network neutrality. This set of arguments is not new. It has played itself out in the development of earlier networks. Evidence about network neutrality or lack thereof in the context of transportation networks follows in the next section. Historically, no other network has been strictly neutral. Rather, neutrality that permits differentiated quality of service and different prices has been closer to practice. Opponents of network neutrality, funded by large telecommunications companies, in contrast to the large web content companies on the other side of the debate, argued that the internet should not be regulated. This logic, too, has arisen in the transport sector, which has swung between unregulated and strict re strictly regulated over the course of time. The issues of common carriage, price discrimination, exclusion and rivalry, and transaction costs are discussed in turn. 29.3. Common Carriage Government regulation has long been an important element of the provision of transportation service, as government permission has been required to construct networks or network elements, for instance bridges, locks, ports, turnpikes, canals. And in some cases, public subsidy provided, most notably land grants and powers of eminent domain associated with railroads, in other cases the public purchase of shares or bonds of private network providers. While common carriers have been identified in English common law since the 14th century, regulation has since the late 1800s assumed an especially important role, particularly for the then largely mature railroad industry, and many networks became re rate regulated. In the United States, the Interstate Commerce Commission was established in 1887. A Supreme Court case a few years later noted, The list of rate regulated occupations is not too long to be here given. It includes canals, waterways, and booms, bridges and ferries, wharves, docks, elevators and stockyards, telegraph, telephone, electric, gas, and oil lines, turnpikes, railroads, and the various forms of common carriers, including express and cabs. To this should be added the case of the innkeeper, as to which no American case has been found, where the constitutional question as to the right to fix his rates has been considered. The confessedly close case of the irrigation ditches for distributing water in the toll mill acts. This, of course, does not include the case of condemnation for governmental purposes or for roads and ways where no question of rates is involved. There may be other instances not found, 
but it is believed that the foregoing numeration exhausts the list of what has heretofore been treated as a public business, justifying the exercise of price-fixing powers against persons or corporations. Bouvier's Laws Dictionary provides a long description of the rights and duties and liabilities of common carriers. Common carriers are paid in advance and in return must deliver passengers safely to their destinations. They also, in general, could not charge more than a posted fare. They could, of course, discount. As any modern traveler knows, when visiting a hotel room and looking at the rates posted on the back of the door, there is usually a large discount between actual prices and maximum prices. There is also a minimum quality of service guarantee. For example, not to overload the coach with either passengers or luggage assures a limit to the congestion on the vehicle associated with common carriage. Common carriage is a much less stringent notion than strict definitions of network neutrality. It does not prohibit offering a higher quality of service. Examples date from the earliest dates of common carriers providing first, second, and third class service. Most widely known are passenger railroads and airlines, which, while common carriers, differentiate quality of service for different fares. This is discussed in more detail in the section below. Other differentiators include means of payment, the willingness to take credit and open accounts rather than requiring cash prior to delivery, as had been required, which helped the United Parcel Service differentiate itself from the U.S. Post Office in speed delivery as when one train or bus service is faster than another, for example, express versus local. But both are provided by the same firm under the same common carrier obligations. The common carriage definition given above applies to carriers, but similar rules may apply to the physical network itself. Turnpikes don't discriminate between trucks based on their content, provided their content is not hazardous, is legal, is driven by a licensed driver, meets weight and size restrictions, and is carried on a legal-sized truck that has paid its taxes and fees. However, the turnpike has not historically guaranteed a speed, though this may be changing as discussed below. Turnpikes also charge different types of trucks different tolls. At one point, California had 17 different rates for trucks at their toll bridge crossings, a number reduced to six only because the automated vehicle classification system the California Department of Transportation developed to administer electronic tolling could not distinguish many of the categories. It should be noted that railroads did engage in value of service pricing. Nome, 1994, further discusses the history of common carriage and comes to the conclusion that common carriage was unlikely to survive in the telecommunications sector, particularly as telecommunications firms became systemist integrators and entered the content arena. 29.4 Price Discrimination Price discrimination is the idea that suppliers charge more to some customers than others. While suppliers do this to maximize profit, it may also be efficiency enhancing, especially if price discrimination is voluntarily selected by the consumer and coupled with service differentiation. One means for doing this is by differentiating quality. Under common carriage, the same vehicle can be divided into different classes of service, first class, second class. Although the classes would depart and arrive in their town at simultaneously on a given vehicle, first class passengers alight at the vehicle first and get better service along the way. A service selected consumers clearly value, otherwise they would not pay the premium. As noted above, even common carriers differentiate quality of service by providing faster speeds for passengers or freight who pay a premium. A second means for doing this is to differentiate customers based on their willingness to pay. For example, when buses give discounts to students or seniors to ride the exact same bus at the same time. In public transit, this is often pitched with an equity rationale, but cinemas provide discounts to the same groups with no such pretense. There are numerous variations and combinations of these two techniques. An example is price light, where approximately equivalent services have lower prices in exchange for less certainty in advance about the quality of service being provided. To go from Minneapolis to Chicago, you might change planes in St. Louis, a significantly out-of-the-way transfer point. Similarly, hot lanes, discussed in section 22.4.6, differentiate roads by quality and willingness to pay. Another transportation example is the Paris Metro which historically, until the mid-1980s, had first-class and second-class cars. The first-class cars would charge twice as much, and passengers would likely get a seat. While in second-class, passengers might be standing in very crowded cars. The system is self-regulating. If the first-class gets too crowded, people stop paying a premium for the better quality of service. If second-class gets too crowded, some people switch to first-class. Andro Odlisko suggested an analog for this for the Internet. Bandwidth would be broken into several channels in different prices. Each channel would make a best effort to move its packets. The more channels, the more closely each individual's value of time would be approximated. 
An important issue that arises is that users are adverse to drowning in a sea of small charges, and many prefer flat rate packages rather than thinking about each decision on a case-by-case -case basis. This is rational for users who have limited time and intellectual resources to devote to optimizing small decisions and would prefer to satisfy. User frustration with airlines who, in what is called yield management, micromanage pricing so that two travelers in adjacent and equivalent seats pay hundreds or thousands of dollars difference in fares or with cell phone company rate plans is notorious. Non-price discrimination has an invidious history in transportation. Most infamously, in parts of the United States, the requirement that blacks go to the back of the bus. The challenge to this, the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955-56, to initiated by Rosa Parks, ultimately launched the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. 29.5 Enclosure, Exclusion, and Rivalry By converting some existing roadway capacity to toll lanes, when they were previously free, not paid for directly, the amount of free capacity is reduced, and those users are generally worse off, except for those with very high value of time, who now find the better service outweighs the additional cost. The perception of equity of new toll lanes depends on whether those lanes were converted lanes or they are new construction. Tolling additional capacity is not resisted nearly as much as tolling what had been seen as free. This echoes arguments put forward by telecommunications companies that additional services pro that provide additional choices should be allowed at higher fees that do not harm existing users. The risk in both transportation and telecommunications is that these existing services somehow come at the cost of existing services. The risk in both transportation and telecommunications is that these new services somehow come at the cost of existing services, which might be allowed to degrade in some fashion, thereby encouraging consumers to upgrade service just to stay in place. In some transportation systems, bypasses put paying customers at the front of the queue for bottlenecks, rather than having everyone queue together, first come, first serve. While this appears to be additional capacity, that capacity is on a non-critical section of infrastructure. A notable example of this is in airport security lines in the United States, where at many airports, first-class passengers can jump the queue to clear security faster because they paid the airline more for their ticket, even though they did not pay more for security, as the security surcharge is a fixed per tax per passenger. Perception of inequity associated with changing social relationships can be the source of significant grievances. There were many riots in the Turnpike era from the late 1600s to the mid-1800s. Between 1839 and 1844, to cite one example from history, there were a series of what were called Rebecca riots in Wales against the construction of gates and imposition of tolls across roads. That resulted in significant destruction of the toll collection apparatus and buildings, and in one case, murder of a toll collector by Rebecca and her daughters, men dressed in women's clothing to hide their identities. In November 2004, there was a riot involving over 1,000 police and significantly more rioters in Jiang City in Guangdong Province, China, when a woman was assaulted by toll collectors after complaining about the toll imposed on her motorbike. As shown in Table 29.1, economists define four types of good, based on whether the good is excludable or not, and whether the good is rivalrous or not. Goods that are both excludable, I can charge you for it directly, and rivalrous, my use prevents or interferes with yours, are called private while goods that are neither excludable nor rivalrous are public, the classic example of which is national defense. The difficulty in drawing analogies is that roads fall into all four boxes. Private goods need not be privately owned, though typically they are in most sectors of a capitalistic market economy. Road financing differs for several of these categories. In Europe and parts of the United States, intercity limited access highways are paid for with tolls charged to users. In many parts of the United States, Local streets are built by developers and in some cases are maintained by local homeowners associations who tax themselves for the privilege. City streets are paid for with a combination of local property taxes and state gas taxes, while state roads and free interstate highways are paid for by state and federal gas taxes. Homeowners are often responsible for the cost of sidewalks and are certainly responsible for their maintenance, snow removal in winter, despite their being public property. This harkens back to the way roads were financed the road was simply a right of passage across private property and was the obligation of the property owners to maintain. Establishment of property rights in cyberspace as the enclosure of common grounds and roads in real space is likely to be a contentious issue. What should be a free commons? What publicly controlled and charged for? And what privately controlled? The rights and expectations of the institutional arrangement and contracts between users and monopolistic providers remain unsettled. 
29.6 transaction costs. An efficiency argument against network discrimination considers that the cost of differentiated pricing may outweigh the benefits because of the transaction costs of implementing toll collection. With pricing and transportation, an entire infrastructure of toll collection and user differentiation needs to be established, and this is not costless. The MinPass hotline system in the Twin Cities does not recover system operating costs and may never recover capital costs, while the London congestion charge, which now charges the vehicle owner eight pounds a day to travel in the center of London before the recent toll increase at enforcement and collection costs of about 67% of operating revenue. These examples compare with less than 1% collection costs associated with gas taxes. The degree to which the costs of collection outweigh the benefits of differentiation depends on the technology of collection and how much interference it imposes on all packets to read each packet and route it on higher speed or slower speed paths based on its origin or fare class. We have long recognized that different types of freight have different priorities. Overnight, two-day, and ground are among the choices for shipping. And in transportation, the transportation profession has slowly begun to recognize that same kind of differentiation applies to drivers. Different drivers have different values of time at different times. Thus, the ability to pay a premium and travel at a better level of service during peak times provides a service not generally available, which may add value to the system and improve overall welfare. There is no reason to believe that different packets don't have different value to different users at different times. Some are more urgent than others. If that differentiation can be achieved with a minimum of transaction costs, a net welfare improvement can be obtained. Whether that is the case is an empirical, not a moral argument. The implications of this are several. High collection costs for discrimination and per-use charging are only valuable if the benefits of the discrimination outweigh the costs. In many examples in transportation, the costs of price discrimination and per-use charging outweigh the benefits by suppressing use and increasing costs. While this of itself does not necessarily favor a regulatory approach to network neutrality, it suggests that providers should be reluctant to engage in non-neutral behavior as that would increase their costs and reduce their demand and perhaps profit. 29.7. Learning, Overengineering, Prioritization In communications, former head of the University of Minnesota Digital Technology Center, Andrew Odlisko, has described the life cycle process as learning, overengineering, prioritization. While this maps to our life cycle process of birth, growth, maturity, and the individual facility process of design, build, operate, it has particular connotations. First, the S-curve of supply growth precedes the S-curve of demand growth. A key aspect is the learning enables us to do things better. This results in a drop in cost over time. As with any system, early adopters pay more for access to the highest quality of service. And we have the familiar economies of scale and density processes that costs drop as more and more users join the system. Due to overengineering, we have excess capacity in early stages. On a U-shaped cost curve, the left side is dominated by fixed costs and the right side by variable costs. Without congestion, large infrastructures, both transportation and communication, are dominated by fixed costs. With congestion, they are dominated by variable costs. We are more likely to see major transportation facilities on the right side of the cost curve as it is easier to lay new wire than new road, rail, or airport capacity. Value of time is also different, communication falling somewhere between passenger and freight transportation. Delaying the message is not the same as delaying the person, but messages usually have higher priority than goods. Yet, communications are now getting so fast that we can get real-time video conferencing or movies on demand with a minimum of latency, even movies that can be delivered faster than in real time, so you can begin watching it and download the rest, so even if you are disconnected later, you can see the whole thing. This differs from physical items or people, which are generally thought of as delivered or not, not being partially delivered. In the end, the final stage is prioritization, as demand eventually catches up with supply and some congestion occurs in the peaks. Prioritization, managing demand and giving precedence to some over others, needs to occur. This might be rule-based, for example, real-time video has preference over movies, or price-based, the cost of transmission increases in the peak, whichever bits people want to pay for get the first dibs. As with transportation, in general there is structural separation between content and cargo and carrier. There are conflicts, among them, those discussed above in the section on network neutrality about carriers privileging their own content over that provided by others. When supply is adequate, this doesn't create problems. If supply is scarce, such privileging has economic consequences. 
Which movie service would you subscribe to? The one that is real time or the one with a one hour delay? 29.8 Discussion Many of the analogies that are used about transportation in the public debate over network neutrality are misleading at best. The internet, like most networks, can be divided into sections, first mile, last mile, and line haul or backbone. The firms that provide these services are different. Each is a potential bottleneck along the trip from content to consumer. While most capacity is unused most of the time, it is the peak times that are of interest, when differentiation matters most. A key difference is that local streets are expected to be slower and serve less traffic. On the last mile of the internet, this creates a bottleneck. In other words, the last mile of roads is seldom rivalrous, except perhaps for on-street parking, while the last mile of the internet clearly exhibits rivalry at selected times and locations. Removing this bottleneck by expending capacity to serve selected traffic can be paid for either by a use charge on the content provider, who may pass it on to their specific customers, or the content consumers, or an access charge levied on all traffic. A use charge falls on those who benefit. An access charge, while smaller per user, falls both on users who benefit and on users who do not. Claiming that access charge is inherently fairer, an implicit argument of some network neutrality advocates, is disingenuous. While homeowners do pay property taxes to support local streets to access the wider network, just as a consumer subscribes to an internet service provider to access the wider internet, and shippers pay property taxes on their end, carriers pay gas taxes for all road use in between as well, including taxes on gas consumed on the access roads and tolls if they are using tolled facilities. In transport, it is customary that the producer pays the shipper for the cost of shipment, a cost which is then passed on to the recipient or consumer. The shipper pays for the truck and labor and fuel and pays fuel taxes on the entire trip. The shipper is partially subsidized by local property owners, including producers and consumers, who pay the infrastructure cost of local roads, the first mile and last mile, through property taxes. Shippers then pass this transportation cost onto the consumers who already paid an access charge. No one source pays for the entire road network, and no one indifferentiated charge should be expected to pay for internet service, which has associated with it both fixed and variable costs, features congestion at time, and for which a per-user charging infrastructure is costly to implement. For highway networks, it has been shown that there is a cost-minimizing split between state and local government shares of highway finance, with neither all state nor all local funding necessarily the most efficient. Although the data for private telecommunications networks are not available in the same way as for public highways, one imagines that there is some appropriate split between charging producers and consumers for the cost of different services, and that split may involve both per-user charges and flat rate access charges depending on the circumstances. While much transportation has fallen under the common carrier rubric, there is not a mode of transportation that strictly adhered to a notion of neutrality that prohibited both price and quality of service differentiation. Some network operators were more intrusive than others in understanding their customer shipments, their characteristics, and their ability to pay. Moreover, different networks offer similar but non-identical services, travel by air versus passenger rail, for instance. In the beginning, successful networks try to remain simple. As maturity sets in, ensuring profits requires differentiating between customers who have both different willingness to pay and desire differentiation in quality of service. While perceived as inequitable or inefficient, product and price differentiation may also be necessary when users of the system impose different demands on it. The network service providers, especially those who have a monopoly or share in oligopoly for service, would like to overcharge and undersupply to maximize profits. In the absence of significant competition and regulation, they will be able to succeed. The difficulty in regulation is finding an appropriate balance between the needs of the consumer and the needs of the regulated provider, without stifling innovation. Internet businesses also remind us of airline and railroad sectors. Several aspects are the boom and bust cycle, the large fixed and relatively low marginal costs, and the winner-take-all aspect. Network industries are subject to large swings in profitability. Why? We can call it the empty seat phenomenon. When an airplane takes off with an empty seat, the airline is leaving money on the table, or the ground. The marginal cost of operating the plane with an additional passenger is almost nil, given the plane is taking off anyway. It would cost but a few dollars in fuel and meals to have it had one extra passenger. When load factors, percent of seats occupied, are high, so are profits. But when load factors drop just a little bit, it implies that demand is softening. Airlines are faced with an unappealing dilemma to try to retain or restore profits. They could try to raise fares to get additional revenue from the remaining passengers, 
but this risks chasing away more passengers. They could try to cut fares to encourage additional passengers, but this lowers revenue from the passengers they would have anyway, as some who would have paid the higher fare now pay the lower fare. They can try to cut cost and service, but this potentially costs revenue as well. Airlines, of course, do all three and hope that by intelligently price discriminating, giving discounts only to marginal travelers, not to inelastic business passengers, they can recover. And of course, they can wait until demand picks up due to external circumstances. Trains and other time-sensitive transportation industries have the same pressures. Internet backbone companies, those that carry long-distance internet communications, are in a similar situation. Unless their wires are brimming with traffic, like the airlines taking off with an empty seat, they are leaving money on the table. The wires are there, costing money, in terms of paying back the lenders or paying off shareholders, whether or not they carry traffic. Unlike manufactured goods, this capacity cannot be stored. A second phenomenon is the lumpiness of network industries. The capacity in networks come in discrete lumps. An airplane which carries 150 or 300 passengers per hour, a wire which carries millions of bits per second, acquiring an airplane or a wire takes time. While there may be a few extra planes lying about, reconditioning them for service is not instantaneous, and orders for new planes take years. Similarly, fiber optic cables take time to lay down. Third, profits during the good years attract new entrants. When times are good and demand is growing, network industries are profitable. These profits provide a signal to others that there are excess profits in this industry, and it is a good field to enter. By excess profits, we are not implying a moral judgment, simply that profits are above the market averages for an investment of apparently the same risk. So new companies enter the market. In the airline industry, buy and recondition a few planes and you can enter the industry. Rent a gate at another airport and you can enter a new market. Every so often, a host of new carriers try to make it in the airline industry. A few survive, a few are acquired, and others go bankrupt when the market turns bad as the economy moves through cycles. Similarly, since telecommunications deregulation in the 1980s, the United States has seen many new entrants, first in the long-distance telephone and then the internet markets. Firms saw potential excess profits and high growth rates. Each assumed that it would capture the lion's share of the new market and built new capacity accordingly. When they found they were not the only company with this idea, but had a score of competitors, prices had to be lowered to a point where they no longer covered the high capital costs, but generally remained above the operating or marginal costs. Thus, there is a situation with excess capacity. Over time, as information exchange explodes, this capacity may become fully utilized, especially if technologies like video, or better yet, 3D projections, over internet take off. But in the meantime, debts have to be paid and companies lack the resources to do so. Hence, we see numerous bankruptcies in this sector. WorldCom, the parent of MCI and Global Crossing, but two of many. Failing companies try to play with demand, as noted above but most eventually cut costs, reducing purchases from suppliers. They may even play with the books, leading to accounting scandals. This reverberates to equipment manufacturers. The reason for overshoot can be understood by returning to the S-curve. Assumed forecasts are made by extrapolating previous results, which is how many businesses and investors operate, as shown in Figure 29.2. In early years, birthing and early growth, the rate of growth each year is greater than the previous year. But in late growth and maturity, growth is slower than the previous year. As connecting or linking technologies, communications and transportation have much similarity, as well as competitive and complementary relations. Work now is mainly concerned with substitution of communications for transportation. An obvious extension is to complementary relations. Communications improvements are already pulling freight transportation services in new ways. A quick analysis says that the improved communications and control are enabling such things as just-in-time inventory policies and real-time traffic control. Deeper analysis is needed for much more than inventory and traffic policy may be involved. We need to know about changed ways of doing business, productivity gains, and the development and use of new production technologies.